Hello, my name is Simon Double and welcome to Inside the Rails, a monthly podcast for horse racing enthusiasts everywhere. And I'm joined as ever by Phil Boyle from BG Racing. Hi, Phil. You weren't too good the last time we did the podcast. How have you been the last month? Yep, no, much better this month. I've had a good month. And and in fact, so have we. Uh, Ah. I probably ought to start by welcoming some new listeners this month as we managed to break pretty much all of our records for downloads in November. It's the best month since we started. And hopefully a few of those listeners have enjoyed what they've heard and have stuck with us and followed us and they'll get this episode as well. Um, I don't know what the reason for that is. Perhaps it's our new Twitter account has helped us to get a few more people involved. And yeah, I hope people will carry on engaging with us on there and, and maybe recommending us to our friends if they're in, to their friends if they're enjoying the podcast. Well, that's great news to hear. And well done on the Twitter account, Phil. I know you've done some sterling work on that. And hopefully our listeners will enjoy our interview with top jockeys agent Tony Hind later on in the podcast. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to that as well. Now, have you had any runners this month? What's been going on in the world of Phil Boyle and BG Racing? (laughs) No runners this month. Uh, Both my horses are actually having a break, but um, we've been lining up a Hurdler on lease, which will get some of our shareholders to the races over the winter. That's with Michael Atwater, my trainer on Epsom Downs. And uh, yeah, actually, I was lucky enough to be invited to the Epsom Owners and Trainers Awards at the race course last weekend from from when we were recording. Uh, That was a really good evening. Uh, The the best bit of it was uh, finding that my dinner jacket still fitted after three years (laughs) in the wardrobe. (laughs) That That was a big plus. But yeah, thankfully, no formal dress required for my next event. I, I've organised to have a stable visit down at Neil Moore Hollands and a Christmas lunch for my shareholders on Sunday the 12th of December. Really? Sunday the 12th? Well, well that's a coincidence because Solaria Racing has its own owner's Christmas lunch on the same day. We're, we're uh, not having a stable visit in the morning, but uh, we are going to a very nice Turkish restaurant in St Albans. And uh, I'm currently preparing the annual racing quiz. For me, that's a bit like Coles to Newcastle because in a former life, I was a question writer. Amongst other programmes, I worked on 15 to 1, which I think is still going. But those were the days when William G. Stewart was the host. So uh, be a bit like old times writing a quiz. Yeah, and it's, it sounds like Sunday the 12th is the best time for, for syndicate lunches across the country. What about on the race course, Simon? Have, you, have your horses been in action? Uh, the two-year-old filly Twilight Bay made her debut about a month ago. Uh, she only beat a couple home at Chelmsford, but she showed a bit of speed. She was drawn out in the car park, as they say, drawn very wide. She was one of only a couple of horses, I think, who hadn't had a previous run. But uh, she is actually running this afternoon at Kempton. Now, by the time this podcast goes out, she'll have run. Well, I mean, if she's still running, I'll really know that I've got a slow one on my hands. <laughs> Um, but uh, no, she's she's running uh, in the first at Kempton, and uh, we're hoping for a bigger run this time. Ah, so um, it's uh, yeah, it's too late for other people to have a bet, but I can still get on. Well, it, it's interesting you say that. It's been an absolute avalanche of money for her um, last night, um, back from really big prices. And and I know people don't believe people in the game when they say it's not my money. I mean, I've had a couple <laughs> of quid on, but uh, it, she has been backed. So uh, look, I think she'll improve. Um, she's been to the track twice before for racecourse gallops and worked nicely. I'd be very pleasantly surprised if she won, but uh, I think she'll improve quite a bit from her Chelmsford uh, debut. Oh, uh, cool. And what else have you been up to? Well, you might remember, I'm sure those listeners who've been with us for a while now might remember that I bought a Burrettino yearling, which is going into training with Amy Murphy. Well, I've been busy putting the marketing material together. Uh, It's being syndicated in 12 shares. Um, It's currently having a bit of a post-yearling sales holiday, if you like, at Childrickbury Stud. Anyway, Amy came down to see the horse, and it's always a bit of trepidation, isn't it, to see whether the trainer likes the horse that you bought. Anyway, relief. She loved the horse, fell in love with him, and uh, she thinks he's been fairly well bought. And he'll go into training at Amy's um, at Newmarket the week beginning the 13th of December, just after the uh, Solario lunch. Cool. So you've been up to plenty, but you forgot to mention the highlight of your month, which was that you you got to spend a couple of hours on Zoom with me with the, the um, Racial Syndicates Association members forum. I did. Oh, so I did. I thought, yes. <laughs> I thought that was really interesting. Actually, it was uh, a really engaging presentation from Diana Arbuthnot from Retraining of Racehorses, and Steve Gibson from Racing Digital was there as well to tell us about the development of new software for owners and trainers. 
Yeah, and it's great that we can get involved in things like that, isn't it? You know, at the ground floor, we can get an opportunity to shape the offering so it adds value to syndicate owners and racing club members. Uh, you're absolutely right, Phil, and uh, we had some really good guests on that Zoom. And uh, I thought it was quite funny, wasn't it, that Di Arbuthnot, um, she was one of the speakers, and we both immediately pencilled her down as a future guest on Inside the Rails. Well, I can reveal I've been in touch with her office, and in fact, she's agreed to be our guest on the January podcast. So that's that's really good news. Anything else caught your eye in the news this month, Phil? Yeah, uh, actually, there was the proposal to deliver weighing room improvements for jockeys in the coming months, which I thought was uh, pretty interesting. I mean, it's only a few weeks ago a jockey told me that weighing room facilities badly needed an overhaul at many tracks, and then, lo and behold, there was an announcement pretty soon afterwards. So it looks like another great bit of cooperation between sort of race courses, the Professional Jockeys Association, the BHA and others. And just, yeah, goes to show what, what you and I talk about on a regular basis, which is what can be achieved when people really work well together. Absolutely. Here, here to that. Um, now, on to racing. You're our jumps man, our national hunt expert. <laughs> and I know that you were at Cheltenham for the November meeting. What caught your eye there? Yeah, in a word, Adagio caught my eye. Ooh, uh, the Martin, yes. uh, Martin Pipe. It's not Martin Pipe, is it? It's David Pipe nowadays. I'm showing my age. The David Pipe runner in the Greatwood was a, a juvenile last year. But he ran in the Greatwood, which is a handicap. He actually had top weight and was up against uh, a lot of more experienced rivals. He finished second. And I must admit, it it wasn't long after the race that I was uh, on my phone securing a big price for this season's champion hurdle because I thought that was a, a really good debut performance for him. He'll obviously have to go some to win the champion hurdle. There's some class horses in there, but it was still a great performance. I like to see Bonte, who won the Mayor's Bumper. She boosted the form of my horse to follow from last month. Uh, You might remember I put up Top Dog, who I think should have beaten Bonte in the October meeting at Cheltenham. Yeah. Um, And yeah, she obviously franked that form. And then Nube Negra was very impressive in the two-mile chase on Sunday. He wasn't a fancy of mine, but uh, he certainly uh, showed that it was no fluke in the champion chase last year. And probably the most memorable moment, I mean, you'll remember as well, was Rachel Blackmore's amazing sit on uh, gin and lime on Friday. Basically, both the two runners in the race fell at the second last and and uh, I'd almost stopped watching. But then I noticed Rachel was sat still as gin and lime sort of slithered to the ground and she managed to stay in the saddle while the horse got itself up and, and was able to continue. Well, it was an incredible piece of riding, wasn't it? Um, I was particularly interested because I'd had a a very, very small little wager on her horse, but I was more interested in the fact of how, uh, uh, you know, she waited. I don't know if listeners will be aware, but actually if her feet had touched the ground, she wouldn't have been able to continue. So she avoided her feet touching the ground, gave the horse a bit of time and then proceeded and then, and then jumped the fence and then won. Um, but I was a bit disappointed to hear some of the criticism from the stewards afterwards, saying that she should have taken more time to assess the well-being of the horse before continuing. I just thought at best it was a little bit negative, really. Uh, and I thought at worst it was it was bordering on insulting, really, to Rachel Blackmore. But uh, what did you think, Phil? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's inevitable they're going to have an inquiry given that, you know, we all put horse welfare at, at the fore. But, but I agree. I think if Rachel said the horse was fine to the stewards, then that's what they should have reported. I mean, we, we all want horse welfare to be given primary importance but absolutely um, that that came across as a suggestion that she'd done something wrong and I'm I'm sure she would have been the first to pull the horse up if if she felt there'd been a problem absolutely now what other performances did you like this month uh yeah I liked Bob Ollinger who won at debut or at Gowran Park the same day that um the other novice chaser Brave Man's Game won at Haydock I think I was more import, uh, more impressed with Bob Ollinger than I was with Brave Men's Game. He looked to do it sort of, you know, it, it was a workmanlike performance for him, but I was quite impressed with it. But Brave Men's Game looked a little bit flashy, but I wasn't totally convinced he had that much left in the tank. Um, just my opinion, but uh, there you go. We'll we'll see as as the days pass and the season goes on. I was delighted to see Lost in Translation come back at Ascot. He lost his way a bit last season. A, a lot of the Tizard runners seemed to have a disappointing year last year, but 
this looked like he was sort of back at the top table. He would he would have to go some if he ends up taking on a Plutard in the any of his subsequent races though, because he was massively impressive in the Betfair chase. I thought I'm I'm still gutted that my big price bet on a Plutard for the Gold Cup last year went went down when he finished second because uh, mm-hmm. he definitely looked like a Gold Cup winner at Haydock yeah. um, when he reappeared. And of course, we then had the two day meeting at one of your favourite tracks, uh, Newbury. Yes, well, it was it was certainly a poignant Saturday, wasn't it? Um, I don't know if any of our listeners have shares in tissue manufacturers, Kleenex <laughs> and uh, other tissue manufacturers are available. But but if they have, their investments, I think, will have gone up because there were plenty of tears. Uh, I should hasten to add tears of joy at Newbury. J.P. McManus uh, won the Peter O'Sullivan Memorial Chase, but in different colours. He, he won it with a horse called Cap Course, and those particular colours were bequeathed to him by the late Sir Peter O'Sullivan in his will. And then the late Trevor Hemmings colours were carried to glory in the Labrooks Trophy. So it really was, uh, there were lots of many poignant moments at the, on that day. I also enjoyed seeing Ahoy Senor winning the Novices Chase, showing that that 66-1 to 1 win in last year's Sefton Novices Hurdle was no fluke. The big one on Saturday, though, was Cloudy Glen winning the feature race. The race was quite lucky for me. I backed three or four in it. Um remastered really I'd like to have seen one uh, he fell four out but I, I think the horse was okay afterwards but uh, I've had a bit of anti-post on on the ropes uh, I also backed the other Trevor Hemmings or the late Trevor Hemmings runner cloth cap uh, and I actually had a few quid each way on the winner so so yeah, it was quite quite a good race for yours truly um, what about you Phil anything to go into your notebook from Newbury yeah, I mean, the obvious one was uh, Nicky Henderson's John Bon, a uh, very expensive purchase, but absolutely romped home on Friday and is now favourite for the Supreme Novices Hurdle at um, Cheltenham. And I ought to mention um, that uh, you're absolutely right, Remastered was fine. When I was doing the Twitter updates one morning, I did see a post of him back in his stables, having uh, obviously recovered okay from his fall at Newbury. Excellent. Um, and then away from Newbury this weekend, there was the big meeting at Fairy House in Ireland. And I mentioned earlier that Adagio might have to go some to win the champion hurdle. Well, he'd probably have to beat Honeysuckle, who, who returned to action and made it 13 wins from 13 starts including nine grade one. So she certainly will be a tough nut to crack. She did it very easily as well. She really is uh, some mare. Absolutely. Now, going back to Adagio, actually, I've, I've taken a little bit of that big price. I think it's still available 40 to one for the champion hurdle. I don't know what sort of price you got, but uh, it does seem quite big for, for a horse. Yeah, there you go. Hopefully our listeners will all send us some thank you notes uh, towards the middle of March. <laughs> and if it doesn't come up trumps, uh, we'll be nowhere to be seen, of course. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, looking at the head at the start of December, we've got the Tingle Creek meeting at Sandown. No Shishkin taking part in the Tingle Creek. This has caused a bit of a furore, a bit of a fuss. What's all that about, Phil? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, a few people were sort of quite upset that, you know, it's it's still a big race, the Tingle Creek in itself. And, um, you know, people feel like the preparation should have been planned accordingly. And and I did read several people saying, well, it just wouldn't happen ahead of the Cheltenham Festival, you know, and the early season targets should have the same importance. And, and that is absolutely right. But it did make me think, however, we do always see stories in the run up to the Cheltenham Festival about horses that have met setbacks or they're not ready and they're waiting for Aintree or Punchestown. And on that basis, I think the criticism of Nicky Henderson was probably a little bit unfounded. You know, if the horse is not ready and that's the right thing to do, it it wouldn't be an unprecedented thing. And that was kind of the way that it was made to seem by some of the some of the press reaction. Um, But even without Shishkin, it should still be a great race. We're doing this recording before the final declarations are made, but there's eight entries and they all look really good. Shakam Soir is the favourite. And if he runs, it'll only be his second race outside Ireland after he was beaten at Cheltenham uh, on the other occasion. He he always looks a world beater in Ireland, though. And if he translates that to um, to the UK, he'll be hard to beat. I mentioned Nube Negru earlier, who won well at Cheltenham in November. And uh, the clash between him and Shakam Porsoir would be pretty mouthwatering. And Alaho's in the entries as well. He won the Ryanair last year at Cheltenham Festival. So he'd be another intriguing runner. And I'm... 
I'm not even mentioning the other five who are all decent as well. There's a couple of Paul Nichols train runners in there. Um, here's hoping most of them turn up and we have a cracking race. If you were having a flutter at this stage, who would you go for, Phil? Let me put you on the spot. Yeah, I think Chacan Poursoir will be hard to beat. Um, I've got a soft spot for Alaho. I'd probably end up having a little bit on Alaho if I could. If I could get sort of five to one and have a little bit each way on Alaho, he's such a consistent and tough sort. If he turns up. 